Your phone is probably the most information-rich item that you own, even more so than your wallet, your passport, or your computer combined, and yet we all carry our phone around with us everywhere we go, day in and day out. Your phone knows a lot about you, and in the wrong hands, or viewed by the wrong pair of eyes, it can give away a lot about you too. Modern phones are built with security and privacy in mind, but there are still some settings that you should be aware of and precautions you should be taking, and I'm going to cover eight of them in this video. Stick with me until the end of the video, as I truly believe every iPhone owner should be aware of these tips. Okay, let's get into it. Features like Find My, when used properly, allow you to share your location with friends and loved ones so that they can locate you more easily or even have visibility of your personal safety from their device. But like everything in life, technology like this can be misused and abused, especially if you've perhaps granted access to someone in your life who you'd no longer like to be able to have that kind of visibility iOS 16 has implemented a really powerful new feature called Safety Check that allows you a couple of options for ensuring that you're only granting access to the people and apps that you want to be granting access to. Let me show you how it works. Open Settings, then choose Privacy and Security, then scroll down and choose Safety Check. The first thing to show you is this option in the upper right, Quick Exit. If you tap this button at any time while changing settings here, your iPhone will jump you immediately to your home screen, but will save any changes that you've made. If you then open settings again, it resets you to the main page of settings and doesn't show where you've just been. If you're making changes here and you don't want anyone else to realize that you've been making changes, this is an important button to be aware of. Emergency reset is exactly what it sounds like. Pressing this will immediately reset access for all people and apps, as well as limiting calls and face ID to only the device that you're currently using. So if what you're after is a quick reset option, this would be it. It's designed more for emergency use when your safety is at risk, but regardless of how you choose to use it, that's what it will do. The other option is manage your sharing and access, which is kind of like an audit of what you're sharing and who you're sharing it with. And I would definitely recommend that you do this at least once or twice a year, perhaps more if you share a lot, to ensure that you're aware of what you're sharing and with who. When you tap on this, your phone will verify it's you first of all, then take you through the audit. In step one, you can see what information you're sharing and with who. Under people, this is broken down by person. Under information, it's broken down by the information categories. So for example, I've allowed two people access to my find my information. I've shared photo albums with 11 people and so on. To make a change to something, select it, then choose review sharing and follow the steps. In step two, you can review which apps have access to your information and what information they have access to. I find that the best way to manage this is actually to head into information and then tap on something like location, for example. You can then see which apps have access to your location and you can choose to revoke this access on a per app basis. You'd be surprised which apps have gained access to your location here, so it's definitely worth a review and of course you might care more about certain types of information than others. Step three involves reviewing which devices are currently signed in with your Apple ID. If there's anything in here that you'd prefer not to be logged in with your Apple ID, perhaps a device that you no longer use or one that you've given to someone else, for example, select it and remove the device. Once done, your changes will be saved and the review will be complete. It would be a bit remiss of me to make a video about iPhone privacy and security without mentioning the use of a VPN. And so to do that, I wanna tell you about the sponsor of today's video, Private Internet Access, and why I've repeatedly recommended them as my VPN of choice. You can use their VPN on all your devices, whether that's your phone, tablet, or computer. So no matter how you access the internet, PIA have got you covered. A VPN essentially reroutes your internet traffic through encrypted tunnels, hiding your browsing data from all kinds of people who might want to access it, whether that's a company that wants to target you for advertising, or even in the worst cases, a cyber criminal. And the number one reason why I recommend private internet access is their transparency, specifically their no-log policy, which they've successfully defended multiple times in court. Private Internet Access even commissioned an independent audit by Deloitte, so you can be sure that your browsing activity is visible to you and you alone. And it isn't just for browsing the web, you can also use their VPN to access geo-restricted content. Private Internet Access have recently announced 50 new servers in each state in the US, making them the VPN with the largest number of servers in the United States. 
So whether that's because you want to access local news, access your bank accounts, avoid live content blackouts, or save money on the best deals you're taking care of. Private internet access offers super fast speeds, worldwide access, and 24-7 support. Use the link in the description of this video to get an 82% discount on the two-year plan, plus three months for free. And thanks again to Private Internet Access for sponsoring this video. Here on my iPhone with Face ID, this is an iPhone 14 Pro, but this will work with any iPhone with Face ID. If I lock the device, I can then immediately use Face ID to unlock the device as you'd expect. However, in extreme cases, this could be used against you, as could Touch ID. Someone could theoretically point your phone at your face without your permission to unlock it, or use your finger to unlock your phone again against your will. If you believe you're ever in a situation where this is likely to happen, you can apply what's known as a hard lock to your device, and it's very quick and easy to do. Instead of locking your phone the usual way, press and hold the side button and the volume up button for a second or two until your phone shows this screen. Then press cancel. Then when you try to unlock your phone using either Face ID or Touch ID, you'll need to input your phone's passcode first, which, so long as you know it and nobody else does, can only be accessed with your knowledge. Obviously, I hope that nobody watching this video will ever need to actually use this function, but if you ever do, at least you now know about it. You should absolutely be using two-factor authentication on your iPhone, in fact, on any Apple devices that you own. If you're not aware, two-factor authentication is a method of verifying your identity twice before allowing you access to something or allowing you to make changes to something. So for example, let's say that today you go out and buy a new iPhone. You begin setting it up, and in doing so, you log in with your Apple ID and password. Without two-factor authentication, that alone would be enough to get you logged into the new device. So in theory, anyone who knows your Apple ID and password could set up a brand new device logged in as you. It's pretty obvious why you wouldn't want this to happen. Two-factor authentication works by first requiring you to log in with your Apple ID and password, but then confirm that you are who you say you are by either receiving a code via text message or if you own other Apple devices like an iPad, a MacBook, or even Apple TV, confirming that you approve of the new device on one of those devices. It's clever stuff, it works seamlessly, and it helps keep your Apple ID safe and secure. To enable two-factor authentication, head into settings, tap on your Apple ID up at the top of the screen, choose password and security, and then ensure that two-factor authentication is enabled. You can also input a trusted phone number in this section, which can be used to help you gain access to your account should you ever have issues in the future. I include this tip because it still amazes me how many people don't allow biometrics on their device, despite them being immediately available and very secure. Touch ID has been around since the iPhone 5S, and Face ID has been around since the iPhone 10. At the very least, you should be enabling a passcode lock on your iPhone, a six-digit PIN that only you should know that you'll use to access your phone. But the reason that you should be enabling biometrics is purely down to the numbers. A four-digit passcode, the absolute least you should be using to lock your iPhone, has a one in 10,000 chance of being guessed, and that likelihood gets much more likely if you use something obvious like 1234 or 0000. If you use a six-digit PIN, that number jumps to one in a million, although you now need to remember a longer PIN as the trade-off. Touch ID is very secure, to the point where Apple claimed that the chances of even a small section of two separate fingerprints being alike enough to register as a match for Touch ID is around one in 50,000. Apple claimed that Face ID is by far the most convenient and safe method of authenticating your device, with the likelihood of someone being able to look at your phone with their face and unlock it being less than one in a million. So if you haven't already, enable the biometrics for your device. Do this by heading into settings and then choosing either Touch ID and passcode or Face ID and passcode depending on your device. Input your passcode, then follow the steps to add the security option of your choice. Oh, by the way, random tip that I had to use recently. If you use Face ID, but find that your iPhone struggles to recognize you when you're wearing sunglasses, for example, toggle off require attention for Face ID in the Face ID settings. This is a little bit less secure than insisting on your phone requiring your attention, but it will save you a lot of frustration if, like me, your phone will not recognize you when you've got a pair of sunglasses on. 
Up until a year or so ago, apps installed on your phone were able to track your activity across other apps and websites on your phone, and your permission was essentially granted for this by downloading the app and creating an account. It's known as ad tracking, and whilst an extremely valuable and profitable tool for the social media companies that used it, it's really of no benefit to you whatsoever, other than it allowed social media companies to target ads to you that were more personal and therefore more likely to convert. Again, this benefits the advertisers and the social media companies, not you. Apple launched a tracking section in iOS 14.5 that required apps to explicitly ask for your permission to be tracked outside of their app, and they do this via the prompt that you can see on screen now. So, two things to point out here. The first is that, in my opinion, you should never be choosing allow here. You should always be choosing ask app not to track. If you're watching this and you can think of a genuinely useful reason as to why you should allow an app to track you across different apps and websites, do drop me a comment and let me know. But the second piece of advice I would give you here is to run an audit of the apps that you might have already allowed and perhaps not realized. To do this, head into settings, then privacy and security, then tracking. This checkbox up at the top of the screen gives apps the permission to request your permission. It doesn't give them permission to track you. Then, if any of the below apps have been enabled, those apps have been granted permission by you to track you. In my opinion, all of these apps should be switched off, but it is, of course, up to you. In the same way that data security experts advise against opening sensitive emails on laptops while you're on a train or on a plane, you should really think about how much information your phone might be giving away whilst you've got it sat on a desk or a table. For example, if someone sends you a text or an email right now, how much of that text or email is visible in the preview that appears on your lock screen before you touch your phone? Could somebody read the first line? Could somebody see the name of the person or the company that sent you the message? This might not sound like a big deal, but that's private information that should only be visible to you when you unlock your phone. So you might want to take some control over how visible your notifications are, especially if you own an iPhone 14 Pro with the always on lock screen. Head into settings, then notifications, then show previews. In here, ensure that this is set to either off, where previews won't show at all, or unlocked, where previews will only show when you unlock your device. This sets the default for notifications on your device in general, but if you like, you can go and do this on an app-by-app -app basis using the app options further down this screen. By the way, if you're enjoying the content, why not consider signing up for my newsletter, The Proper Weekly? I include some tech news, a behind the scenes of what's happening here on the channel, as well as a tip for a product in the Apple ecosystem. The newsletter goes out each Friday, it's free to sign up, and I'll include the sign up link in the description of this video. Data breaches in general aren't good, but there's a side to data breaches that a lot of people don't think about. Let's say, for example, that you buy greetings cards online from a greetings card company and they suffer a data breach. Maybe the only data that was accessed was email addresses and passwords for that site, nothing more. So as a customer, you're informed of it, you change your password at the impacted website and you get on with your life, happy that your details are once again safe. Plus, even if the hackers gained access to your account, it's only a greetings card website and they don't store your payment details, so no harm, right? Problem is, hackers are often looking beyond the site from which they gained access to your details. What they'll do is use the email address and password that they've just accessed and try it in other, more important websites, like your email provider. According to research by the Harris Poll, 78% of Gen Z users utilize the exact same username and password for several online accounts. It's a bit like having a key cut that opens the lock on your garden shed, but also opens your car and the front and back doors of your house. You just wouldn't do it, yet a lot of us do it with our passwords. Apple offer a function called Sign In with Apple. It's not available on all websites, but it is showing up at lots more sites these days. Essentially, when you come to register on a website and you see this option, tapping that button will allow you to sign up using a randomly generated email address that automatically forwards to your main email. So you won't experience any difference in the overall service, but if the site you're logged into was ever breached, the worst that would happen is the hacker would have a random, unique email address with no visible link to you, making it almost impossible for them to then use that information to gain access to any of your other accounts. Of course, the other key takeaway here is that you should never use the same password more than once, but as an additional security measure, using sign-in with Apple is a great idea. 
I'm a fan of Safari as a browser. I think that the default iPhone browser is already very good when it comes to privacy and security, but there are still some settings that I'd recommend you at least have a look at. We do that by going to Settings, then Safari. First of all, if you like, you can change your default search engine. This is a tricky one. I hate the amount of data that I know Google is openly pooling about me each time I search, but at the same time, they are the market leaders when it comes to search, so I can understand why people might choose to stick with them. Nevertheless, you can change to Yahoo, Bing, DuckDuckGo, or Ecosia in this section here. If you then scroll down to privacy and security, there's a few things we can look at here. I would absolutely recommend having prevent cross-site tracking toggled on. This will help limit sites' abilities to track your activity from one site to another, and I would ensure that you choose from trackers under the hide IP address section. Finally, I would toggle privacy preserving ad measurement to off. This is Apple's method of allowing marketers to still measure the performance of their ads whilst focusing on user privacy. Essentially, marketers can tell that someone clicked on an ad, but there's nothing that can link that back to you. That, to me at least, isn't really something to be concerned about, but if we're here and we're tightening up all of our security options, we may as well include it. So there you go, eight tips to help you ensure that you're doing all that you can to keep your iPhone experience as private as you possibly can. What do you think? Any important tips that I've missed out? Drop me a comment and let me know. And as ever, if you found this video useful, do please consider leaving me a like and subscribing to my channel for more content like this in the future. See you on the next video.